I'm uh, John Fitzsimmons. I'm a painter. I've been painting for 50 years. I live and work in Syracuse. Um, and uh, the paintings in this show are from the last two years thereabout, all figurative. Talk a little bit about your exhibition, Rhythms. How did it come about? Why is it called Rhythms? And what inspired it? About two years ago, two to three years ago, I was reevaluating my artwork. And I tend to go in a lot of different directions. And uh, I decided, all right, all I'm going to do is figurative art for the next few years. And I'm going to do a series of paintings of women. And that's all I'm going to do. Nothing else. Um, of course, that's not what I did, but that was the plan. So um, that's what that's where these paintings came from. So just concentrating on as much as I can um, in one direction, and um, things develop. I let things go where I want them to go or where they want to go, and uh, these are the results. Uh, rhythms um, really comes from this painting because it is about rhythm. So you have the four figures, all the same model, by the way, the four figures, and very much like the artist Giotto, Giotto, depending on, creates the, pulls together the painting by the rhythm on different levels. So you have the face, dun, 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 dun. You have the hands, da, 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 da. You have the feet, da, da, da. And then your eye gets pulled up again and you go around and around and around. So that's where that name came from, rhythm. Your works come from nonverbal ideas and these ideas may float in your head for months before mm -hmm. they're visualized. Would you see your work as a result of a stream of unconsciousness? And why did you choose figurative art as your expressive mode? I think I've always had similar uh, directions or similar uh, intents in my paintings. And um, I did a series for a long time, what I call treetop paintings, and these are images looking up into trees. Mm -hmm. And it offered all kinds of great uh, opportunities for color and composition and rhythm and whatnot. Um, and then I took some of those same sensibilities and applied them to the figurative work. Um, so when I say they're nonverbal, the nonverbal idea, um, these aren't illustrating a specific idea or feeling or story that can be told verbally. Mm -hmm. So let's say you had um, this contrast to um, an artist who I love is N.C. Wyatt, yeah, Andrew at Wyatt's father, who was you know one of the great illustrators, and did these tremendous illustrations for um, the, the Golden Age illustration. Those all told a very specific story. So you have. Um, uh, the leather, you know, the, the um, leather stocking stories and whatnot. So here's a, a hunter and his canoe and a lake and this and that. It's all telling a story and it relates back to a literal literary story. And that's all great, but that's an illustration. The painting has to number one be a painting has to be a painting. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily, it can, but I don't want it to tell a specific literal literary story. This painting is not illustrating a particular event. Mm -hmm. uh, that painting is not so on and so forth. 
it's, it's, it's the nonverbal idea. It's a thing that you cannot necessarily describe verbally. You can talk about it. After the fact, I can talk about it. Sometimes I use it as an excuse not to talk about it. <laughs> it's a convenient excuse, by the way. It works good. Um, but um, I don't want people to think, well, you know, this is, uh, this is a specific woman and this happened to her and this is a, no, that's not what it is. For one thing, like I just said, the, in the end, the painting has to be a painting. And it's, it's uh, ultimately about itself and it has to function as a painting. The other thing is, I believe a piece of art has to have a life of its own. When it leaves my studio, it's on its own. And you today looking at that, it means something. Hopefully it means something to you. Uh, and that's going to be different than what it means to me. Ten years from now, it will mean something different to somebody else and so on and so forth. And I think a great illustration of this is um, in the 19th century, Vermeer's paintings that we hold so dear today, nobody wanted them. It's like, I think the girl, the pearl, pearl earring, uh, and I'm probably wrong on the numbers, sold for like 150 bucks or something like that. And, um, it was just, you know, another old painting, right? Now it means a great deal to us. Why is that? Things change. We have different sensibilities. The painting has a life of its own. Um, and, you know, that's another thing. It's not, it's, I'm not trying to make things so specific that I'm trying to control its meaning. They mean something to me. They mean something else to you. They'll mean something else to somebody else. They might mean nothing to that person. Um, I got a great compliment once. Uh, and this woman told me one of my paintings made her cry. I said, wow, that is a great compliment. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that you were not like having a specific idea of what you're painting, but just kind of like going with the flow and painting out the ideas that have been? It's kind of. Kind of. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, it's, it's a nonverbal idea. It's like I have, I'm looking and I'm digging for that thing that's out here. Sometimes I, I really know where it's going, mm -hmm. and sometimes I don't. But sometimes I know where it's going, but I don't know how to get there. Mm -hmm. I think that that's, that's a better description. Mm -hmm. I know where it's going, but I don't know how to get there. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll be working on a painting, and very soon it's like, oh man, this is a disaster. Uh, you know, the awkward age is just, wow, this is, this is a mistake. And then it starts coming together, and I, I get mm -hmm. to that. I, I kind of like, oh, now it's, now it's a painting. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, and that's the point that you know that, oh, this is complete and you can stop here. The story is... Hopefully complete. I don't take it too far. Into it. Okay. So can you like walk us through a little bit, um, tell us a little bit about the two, like the largest paintings, the two main paintings from this exhibition? Uh, I hire these models who I may not even know. I didn't know this young lady. Um, and um, which kind of enters into it because the model, even if you don't know her, even if you don't have it as part of your intent, influences where you go with it. I wanted to do some paintings with this repetition. Um, I posed her, I think I took 400 photographs in this session and drawings. I had a vague idea what I wanted to do with this repetition, you know, with this, uh, with the repetition. And um, then once I get the photographs and I start printing them, um, I'll collage them together and cut them, and arrange them, mm -hmm. whatnot. And then uh, grid it up and enlarge it and then I start painting. So with this one, I had a, a pretty good idea what I wanted to do with the lights and the darks. The tonal structure is very important. Um, the color, I'm really simplifying my color now. So it's a really very, very simple color. Uh, obviously it's black and, and uh, red, and the grays are supporting the blacks and the reds. Mm -hmm. So if you took a black and white uh, photo of this, 
it would still make the same pictorial sense. I think that's important. And, and, and it's something I think a lot of painters um, either don't understand or, or don't get where the tonal structure is what holds the painting together. Mm. Even if it's about color, that tonal structure has to be there. Because otherwise the, the color doesn't have anything to hang on. And you can do the tonal with the color, but the tonal has to be there. So um, in the process, if anything, I simplify as I go along. So I almost always end up painting out the backgrounds and you know, playing with this line down here, the implied floor wall line. Mm -hmm. uh, I add those shadows to pull the feet together so that the shadows from the legs are uh, casting over the other feet. Pull that uh, together. And the grays allow the other colors to expand outward. So if these, if this wasn't a grayed down color, it'd be competing against the red. Mm -hmm. By making it a gray, it allows the red to mm -hmm. expand upward. It's mm -hmm. not pushing back on it. Mm -hmm. um, and then this scumbled gray, just kind of reinforces this rhythm across here. Mm -hmm. So, on the other one, so again, this is um, part of that same series about the repetitive figures. Uh, and I'm still working on this series. I have, I'm just continuing with it. Um, so there's two figures. Now two has a lot different pictorial um, possibilities, limitations. It's very, very different than four because it's kind of like the difference between uh, a couple, a few, and many. So a couple, of course, two, a few, maybe three, maybe four, kind of three. Uh, but a couple has more specific meanings than more than three, I think. So with four figures, it becomes more about the rhythm. With two, it becomes more about the relationship between the two images. So um, this becomes, all right, what, what's, what's she doing? What's, what's she doing? Is she reacting? Again, this is the same model repeated. Um, it's, um, it started with a white background. I went to the black background. Um, for a couple of different reasons. This V shape here is very important, but it was overwhelming everything. So by making that basically black um, and then having these transitions, uh, it pulls things together more. And at the same time, makes the face pull out. But <clears throat> this was tricky because um, your eye was drawing a little bit too much to the face and not to the rest of the painting. So, I, of course you want, you want, you're drawn to the face and then you're drawn to whatever that face is, is uh, appearing to look at. So you're drawn to it and you pull right off the painting. So <clears throat> these strong diagonals pull you back in, the rhythm of the feet so it pulls you around, pulls you up, and then around. And then you kind of think, oh, what's going on over here? And you start looking at this. So this painting evolved a lot mm -hmm. from uh, how I started. And this is a good example where I get certain way into the painting, and it's like, oh, man, this is a disaster. I'm going to paint this thing out. And um, I, I made it work. Changed the color a lot. Changed the, the uh, value plan a lot. Mm -hmm. And quite often I do that the last hour. <laughs> I work out of the month and then end up repainting it. Uh -huh. No time at all. So. What reactions do you wish you get or hear from your audience when they're viewing your work? I, I just hope that it means something to someone.